Today's episode of Yesterworld is somewhat... Camera guy, I'm over here. Today's episode of Yesterworld is somewhat unique and calls for a different kind of introduction. This you may recognize as a maintenance service elevator, still in operation, waiting for you. Uh, still in operation, waiting for you. Oh well, this is awkward. Never had this happen before. Doors are supposed to open and, uh... Well, in the meantime, how about we explore some spooky Disney theme park secrets, myths, and unsolved mysteries, a journey into the darker side of the happiest place on Earth. When it comes to the Haunted Mansion's mysteries, myths, and urban legends, the Disneyland original often gets the spotlight. Of course, by far the most famous example is the Hatbox Ghost, a subject that's been covered countless times by myself and many others, but he's also connected to several mysteries within Magic Kingdom's Haunted Mansion. A second identical version was created by Imagineers and was supposed to go into Florida's version when it opened in 1971. But with all the headaches of trying to get Disneyland's version to work, which ultimately led to its permanent removal within months of opening, Magic Kingdom's version was never installed and omitted from the final blueprints. However, one effect that was installed has been shrouded in mystery as to whether it was ever functional, a falcon-shaped banister that seemed to follow vehicles traveling through the music room to the grand staircase. Schematics show this illusion in detail, and even almost 50 years later, the banister shows markings to prove it's still on the ride, but for when and how long the movement's been abandoned is unknown. But an even bigger mystery immediately after this effect was the man in web, where just after climbing the staircase amid terrifying screams, you came face to face with a decomposed skeleton of a man stuck in a web. If you should decide to join us, Final arrangements may be made at the end of the tour. You would then pass by two other spider webs, only these ones containing the spiders that had consumed the rather unhappy haunt. However, aside from the spiders, audio and an oddly vacant web in its alleged location, for nearly 40 years there was no visual evidence to support the man and web's existence. That was until an original piece of concept art surfaced, featured within the second edition of the Haunted Mansion from the Magic Kingdom to the movies. But now, to survive, you must gain your sight. I must first gain your underwear! Perhaps the only good thing to come from the live-action Haunted Mansion, it wasn't long before another discovery was made. Inside the attraction's reference manual are breakdowns of show scenes, props, and animated figures, and one listed the man and web that correlated to its supposed location, along with the griffin mentioned earlier. The general consensus from Haunted Mansion historians is that the figure was briefly installed and present in the ride, specifically during cast member and executive previews the month before its grand opening. The common reason given for its removal is that it was just too scary. However, according to an original Haunted Mansion cast member of over 30 years, it was for looking too hokey. This would actually make sense, as then-director of park operations Dick Nunes made a similar decision with the Jungle Cruise, in which he demanded the removal of the now infamous animatronic frogs as created by Mark Davis, but that's another story for another episode. According to various cast members, after its removal, the figure was kept below one of the show scenes and used to scare staff members, with one saying it finally left the mansion for good between 1976 to 1980. When Pirates of the Caribbean opened in 1967, which had cost more to build than Disneyland itself, it was an instant hit. It was by far the park's most immersive experience, with intricate and detailed set decorations unlike anything visitors had ever seen. And it's pretty widely known that initially the ride featured elements that would be heavily frowned upon today. It's sore I be to oist me colors on the likes of that shy little wench. I be willing to share, I be. <laughs> Another was the fact that all of the skeletons seen in the attraction were once living, breathing human beings. 
As the story goes, the creative team wanted the skeletons to look as realistic as humanly possible, but plastic skeletons at the time just weren't convincing, such as those used in the original Peter Pan and Snow White Dark Rides. So Disney reached out to UCLA's medical center to see if they could lend a hand, or a head or two. There's some variations to the story, but the skeletons were either donated by UCLA to be part of the ambitious attraction, or simply purchased by Disney. Regardless, from opening day up until the 1970s or possibly early 80s, these actual human skeletons remained in the show scenes, but as technology improved in the widely popular field of plastic skeletons, they were eventually replaced, but allegedly not all of them. I don't like the looks of this happen. <laughs> The skeleton in the captain's headboard is often cited as the only remaining actual human skeleton, but according to the crew over at the Ears Up podcast, there's actually more. Through up-close physical and visual examinations made possible by an obviously anonymous cast member, they concluded that three of the deceased pirates still had portions of real skeletal remains. This was apparently verified by another source, again also anonymous, so all that's left is a special episode of Mythbusters to put this legend to rest once and for all. In the 1960s, a very peculiar sign showed up at Disneyland, announcing post-lifetime leases available for ghosts and restless spirits. Of course, this was simply promotion for the upcoming attraction The Haunted Mansion, but the plan backfired as actual spirits began to show, and while the sign was taken down, by then it was too late, and they still reside in the park today. What, you don't believe me? Fine, let's just explore some alleged ghost sightings within the park. Way to ruin the fun. The most famous example is probably the Haunted Mansion security camera footage, showing what appears to be a ghostly figure walk out of the attraction. The event was captured by not one or even two separate cameras, but four, which is part of what made this even more of a viral sensation. Some have even given it a backstory of Walt Disney's ghost riding the attraction he never got to see fully realized and heading back to his apartment on Main Street, which some believe is also haunted by his spirit. But rest easy, as this footage has since been analyzed and thoroughly explained by Captain Disillusion. It's a technical glitch caused by a worn out recording head capturing footage of an empty park onto a recycled VHS tape that already contained a different night's recording of a maintenance worker walking through the same area. Another sighting made even more spooky by its clarity is the Tower of Terror footage, when not one, but two ghostly images appear at different points in the video. You can even see when the spirits scare the inspector, or it's just his underestimation of the ride's thrills. Yet another ghost allegedly captured by a security camera is known as Mr. One Way at Space Mountain, but I put forward that it's 2019 and could be Mrs. One Way. Of course, the explanation for both of these is likely the same as the Haunted Mansion footage, but now we get to a couple truly baffling ones. At first it appears to be a simple photo in front of the Snow White Grotto statues, the camera pans, and seemingly nothing, but upon further inspection, there's something else. Unlike the previous examples, the camera work and angle would make a previous imprint matching that particular spot almost impossible, and it seems to be gone when the camera passes again. But there's one final video that in my opinion is the most creepily unexplainable. Now many have said this is simply a cast member watching the fireworks from the castle, but putting aside the absolutely ridiculous safety violations and non-official uniform, he or she is, you know, transparent, and doesn't seem to be in the previous shot moments earlier. Even more strange is that after the show, he or she sticks around for a while before literally vanishing into thin air. This is the only one that truly gives me the willies, so if someone can offer a logical help me sleep at night explanation, I would really appreciate it. From the very beginning of its inception, the Tower of Terror was designed as more than just a thrilling ride experience, but with one of Disney's most genuinely eerie and foreboding atmospheres. The attraction opened in 1994 at Disney's MGM Studios, and after visitors traveled through the queue, boarded their elevators, and were given a tour of the fifth dimension, it was time for the ride's grand finale. Fast forward to the early 2000s, as while the Tower of Terror was always a haunting experience, something changed in the finale, and visitors began spotting ghosts in their elevator's drop shaft. 
That's where the story ended for me in 2016, as I originally planned this subject for Yesterworld's first episode, exploring abandoned effects. But occasionally, what was once a signature effect or showcase of technology becomes a broken or abandoned remnant of the past. Oh, 2016 Mark, just loosen up your voice over a little. Back then I hit a roadblock, because as it turns out, the effect wasn't abandoned, just very peculiar, and I can finally now give the story some closure. You see, the original version of the Tower of Terror featured a single drop after the fifth dimension. The elevators rose to the top and dropped to the bottom, and that was it. <laughs> Then in 1996, version 2 was implemented, known as Twice the Fright, which now featured a second drop. Travel to the height of fright in a haunted freight elevator for a gut-wrenching, faster-than-gravity freefall. Then, rocket back to the top of the shaft and do it again. Three years later in 1999, a third version made its debut as Fear in Every Drop, featuring a more complex pattern of stops and drops before plummeting to the basement, but again, it was the same experience every time. But then came version number 4 in 2002, known as Never the Same Fear Twice, which now implemented a computer system to randomly choose one of four drop sequences. Disney MGM Studios. Never the same fear twice. It was during this update that a set of newly randomized events was added to the experience, sometimes a crashing window or the doomed hotel guests by way of projections, but other times it was a physical appearance of the Tower of Terror's permanent residence, but the effect was incredibly unpredictable. First, you have to know that when creating these figures for the elevator shaft, Disney simply reused the molds for the ones in the fifth dimension scene. The left side known as Foxtrot featured the father and mother, and the right side known as Echo featured the little girl and nanny. When working properly, the figures would be lit up with strobe lights, accompanied by the little girl singing It's Raining It's Pouring, with an air blast at the elevator. However, as you can probably tell by now, it's always been incredibly hit or miss. Sometimes you'd hear the singing and feel the blast of air, but no ghost. Other times they would appear without the music for just a fraction of a second. But the creepiest is when they would appear during the randomized flashes, meaning visitors wouldn't even realize they captured the spirits until reviewing their footage later. The effect still exists today, but is very unpredictable, but hopefully you can experience it for yourself before the original Tower of Terror goes the way of California adventures. With Disneyland's The Haunted Mansion, sometimes the difference between fact and fiction is blurred. There's the abandoned hallway scene, in which visitors would feel and hear a ghost approaching, even brushing by a suit of armor, seemingly passing straight through them with a blast of chilly air. As while the various elements of the effect were installed, many argue as to whether it was ever functional, even if during previews or the soft opening. There's also the supposed and very brief alternate ending, in which eerie lights replace the hitchhiking ghosts, possibly before they were installed or working properly. But one had many visitors questioning their sanity for many, many years, and still does to this day. For those brave enough is the Haunted Mansion, a place filled with ghoulish delights. Once the Haunted Mansion opened in 1969, guests would often report seeing a moving light in one of the windows, as if a ghost was walking through the room. What made this possible encounter even stranger is that years would pass between sightings, allegedly sometimes even more than a decade. Now before you go calling the Ghostbusters, rest assured it's simply an illusion that dates all the way back to the attraction's development. Initially, there was to have been someone physically in the window, with a very early idea having he or she pulled back into the darkness. The light in the window effect was achieved with essentially a rotating coffee can and a light bulb, about as simple as you can get. 
The reason the effect had such a mysterious existence comes down to maintenance, as unlike effects within the Haunted Mansion, whenever it stopped working, it was seen as very low priority and would go years or possibly even a decade between fixes. The energy crisis of the 1970s and 80s would have added to the mystery, as many non-essential lighting effects within the park were shut down for very long periods. The Haunted Mansion at the Magic Kingdom has a similar story, where from day one, a strange light would travel by multiple windows room to room. But unlike Disneyland's, the effect was rarely, if ever, completely out of commission for every single window, so it was often seen by far more visitors on a regular basis. So the next time you're at Disneyland's Haunted Mansion, you might just witness this historically hit or miss effect. With the 1983 new Fantasyland update at Disneyland, one of the park's frequent complaints from visitors was finally rectified, in which main characters such as Snow White, Peter Pan, and Alice were in their own attractions. That may sound like an obvious thing to do, but prior to the massive overhaul, none of the Fantasyland dark rides featured the main characters, as the original idea was for the visitors to experience the story as the main characters. However, in 1972, a mysterious attempt was made to fix this in Snow White and her adventures, with a generic department store mannequin dressed as the iconic princess. I stress mysterious because according to Imagineers and the official on-the-record Disney history, none of the attractions featured any of the main characters until the 1983 update. What's even more strange is that this unofficial fix to Snow White would influence the official design of her figure many years later. Adding to the mystery is that the figure was gone by the time the attraction was closed for its overhaul, so no one really knows how long it was there. A somewhat similar example is the yet-to-be-explained couple from the Carousel of Progress. The photos were taken at Disneyland around 1974, when the attraction was being deconstructed for its move to Walt Disney World. However, the figures and set decoration never appeared in the original New York World's Fair version, Disneyland's, and certainly not the Magic Kingdom's. The Carousel of Progress does have a history of scene changes and alterations, some drastic and some minor, such as the risque daughter scene being altered for Disneyland's version, which is the one I missed in my original evolution of Carousel of Progress episode and it's been bothering me ever since. So it is possible they were created for an unused and uninstalled version for its time at Disneyland. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell, and we'll see you next time on Yesterworld.